Hello, hello, friends. Welcome to another episode of Talk with Renee Dallow. It is me, your host, Renee Dallow. And this week, I'm joined by the lovely and fabulous Lynn Stevens. Lynn, how are you? I'm good. Thanks. Thanks for having me, Renee. I'm so excited you're here. It's been a million years since I've actually seen your beautiful face in person. Uh, I think it was 2019, the last time we saw each other, right? Yeah, Cartagena. That's right. We were we were international together, babes. We're international yeah. friends is what it is. <laughs> Um, well, Lynn is here today to talk about her journey with ADHD. And I think we have a little disclaimer, right, Lynn? Yes. So my disclaimer is all of this is based on my experience. I am not a doctor. This is not medical advice. Please don't self-diagnose yourself. But if you recognize something, maybe see a doctor about it, if it makes sense for you. However, this is, you take this with a grain of salt because this is just my own lived experience. Exactly. And my disclaimer for this episode is y'all last time we talked about neurodivergence on an episode, y'all sent me emails being like, you know, you have ADHD, right? And although I appreciate the care and concern and attention to me, um, let's not diagnose each other on the internet, right? Let's not, right. let's not do that exact thing. Even though TikTok thinks that I have ADHD because it likes to serve me uh, that content. And so it remains to be seen what the future holds for me. But um, I'm excited to hear more about, you know, the last couple of years of your life and kind of your journey with all of this. So I guess just to start is that I was not officially diagnosed until my late 30s. I'm in my early 40s now. So it was relatively recent. Um pretty much just before the pandemic. And that said, looking back over my life, once I got that diagnosis and was told what ADHD looks like, what it can look like in women, how it can manifest itself, so much of my life made sense. I was like, oh, well, my entire life could have been different. That must have um, been a relief. A relief, but there's also a grief that oh. comes with it. Yeah, because sure. especially if it's if the diagnosis is coming much later, you know, I I was basically 20 years into adulthood at that point. Yeah. And it's like, oh, my entire 20s could have been different. Most of my 30s could have been different. My high school years could have been different. And so there's this grief of what never was and what could have been and how much different it could be, but also maybe how much better it could have been, you know, how much better it could have been had I known and had I had access then to the skills and medications and other things that help you live with it. Because ADHD is a neurodevelopment disorder for adults, persistent adult ADHD, which means you have it your entire adult life. It's the global population. It's just under 3% is who it impacts. Um, TikTok will make you think it's, you know, 98%, but right. it really is just under 3%. But part of the problem is with diagnosing it is that it co-presents and coexists with a lot of other issues. So right. um, it's very common to have depression and anxiety with ADHD, but it is also common for ADHD to look like depression and anxiety. So right. you're being treated for those things, but not the ADHD. So those things never clear up or get better or go away. It presents differently in women, or it can. Um, again, this is my experience and my understanding. So new research may show this is different, but from what I've seen from evidence-based research is that it can present very differently in women. And whether that's actually biologically presenting differently or just from social norms that's how it's spotted i don't right. know right but well, i know growing up, like when we heard about adhd it was always young boys right that was right. like that was what we had heard societally as like oh oh that's a thing that young boys get and then they give them ritalin and it's fine i mean i'm dating myself because i'm i'm older than you um but I also wonder too, like what you said is like, are the symptoms different or, or as women we're conditioned to just mask them because of what society expects from us? Who's to say? Right. And I think it's a little bit, they say that inattentive ADHD presents more commonly in women. 
So like with boys, they're acting out and hyper and it's like, oh, boys will be boys. That's how they are. Whereas for young girls in school, it's very much, oh, she's just an artsy, creative daydreamer. Because ADHD is, I think part of the issue is the name, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. Right. Hyperactivity sometimes doesn't manifest physically. It's your brain being hyperactive, but like on the outside, you're still, you have it together. I would say that's me. And deficit, you don't have a deficit of focus. You have an inability to regulate where you're focusing. So you can be all this stuff, but you can't focus on what you're supposed to be focusing on because your brain is a million miles away focusing on something else, whether that's a distraction in the room or, um, you know, something you said in third grade that's still bothering you when you're in your forties, like whatever it is, whatever it is, you don't have the executive function and ability to focus on that thing. So I think the name's a little bit misleading with that yeah. deficit. I agree. But, um, yeah, for me, it was, it is that the inattentive type where um, it looks like I'm paying attention, but my mind is somewhere else or on a million different things at once. But at the same time, I can pay attention and recall things years later, even if it seems like I'm not. So um, yeah. there's something called... Oh, gosh, I'm blanking on what it's called. But it's basically ADHD can impact your uh, short term memory in that yeah. I don't know. I don't know what I had for breakfast this morning. Like, right, I'd have to sit and think about it and go in my kitchen and look and see what's missing to tell right. you what I had for breakfast this morning. <laughs> However, I can recall conversations almost verbatim from 15, 20 years ago tell you where in the room we were standing because I can spatially, mentally, visually see it. Yeah. Um, you know, like, oh, we were at the front by the stage, by the podium. And like, you came up to ask me Q and A after my talk, blah, blah, blah. And it was in, you know, this conference, this date. I am very good at that. Um, breakfast this morning? No, no, no clue. I have no okay, idea. So, so what led you to seek a diagnosis? Because I mean, pre, I, I will say for me, hearing that you got a diagnosis pre COVID um, mm -hmm. feels like, oh, okay, that's different. Because so many people I know have been diagnosed since COVID. My personal opinion that is we spent so much time alone with ourselves that we were like, oh, is this how I am now? So you did it. You're pre COVID. Mm -hmm. I'm like, okay, tell me what was happening. Yeah. So some of the things and the way it manifests it's basic. This is how I like to explain it. So for any of your listeners who have been pregnant, the, you know, hormonal fluctuations during pregnancy can cause um, short term memory loss, brain fogginess, issues with executive function. ADHD is like having pregnancy brain every single day of your life 24 seven. It is a lot like that. But it is also this, sometimes there is this inability, even though you really, really want to do something, yeah. your brain has the inability to get it done. Like you just cannot bring yourself to do it. It's almost like there is like a literal wall of fire between you and that thing. And you just can't pass through it because you know, you're, for some reason, your body and your brain is sensing that it's dangerous, even if it's not. And um, for a long time, it was thought ADHD is a, you know, had to do with poor parenting or video games or all of these things. But the latest research has shown that it really is biological. It's genetic. And there are over 7,000 different genes involved in it that oh. contribute to it. And part of the problem with diagnosing it is none of those genes are a majority contributor. It's all a little bit from all these different things. So it's the combination so it can't um, be easy. No that gets you, right. right? Like it's a collective effort on the part of your genetics to F up your brain. <laughs> like that is what's happening. Thank you so much. So when, you know, people think, and especially because, you know, I was in school in the eighties and nineties. So it was very much like willpower, just sit there and get over it. And yep. 
curriculum, you know, at the time, not curriculum, but um, the practice at the time for discipline in schools was very punishment based and like deprivation takes something away. People with ADHD are not motivated by that type of that motivation style. Like, you know, yeah. I always had trouble doing my homework. Again, it was just that wall of fire. Like, I just can't get it done, but I was great at tests. So, because I'm still smart, right? Like, it wasn't, you're not dumb, but you feel dumb. You feel lazy because you just can't seem to get to get through and get that thing done, even mm-hmm. though you really want to. So, like, with homework, they'd be like, okay, you're going to, like, either stay inside and skip recess or you're going to sit on the wall at resource. Now I'm dating oh. myself. <laughs> I remember you know, putting on the like, wall, though. I feel you on that one. I sat yeah. on the wall every day. And just, like, nothing. it didn't phase me. And so then they're like, oh, you're just apathetic and you don't care. Uh-huh. So um, and in adulthood, that can carry over to deadlines you know you have to meet and you're just not meeting them. I mean, again, the 80s, 90s kids will relate. We're all just trying to earn our personal pan pizza. So we very much respond to the reward system. Those stickers, definitely oh. for an entire generation, your star stickers. However, for ADHD, even more so, we're motivated by that. Um, but like the motivation style that's kind of negging or like no one feels sorry for you and like, if you can't do this, you're not really trying hard enough. And if you cared, you would just get it done. That doesn't work on us. And it just triggers a further shame spiral. So interesting. Yeah, I relate to all that. I mean, the I think there was so much about growing up in the 80s and 90s where they just didn't like, in, this is a separate thing, but it, it relates, in, at least in my brain, is that like when I was a kid, I was deeply, 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 I mean, I still am quote unquote, bad at math, right? I'm making air quotes in case you guys aren't watching on YouTube. And like my whole life, it was like, that was my personality, right? I was bad at math. Well, like a couple of years ago, I tested and I have dyscalculia, which is like dyslexia for numbers. Like Mm -hmm. I literally don't see the numbers as they are. So I switch four and seven, I switch eight and three, five and nine. It does they don't even have to look the same in my brain. They're just mixed up. Right. No one in my, no one growing up thought maybe we should test her. Maybe something's actually wrong. So when you're saying these things about like, yeah, I was ADHD as a child. This is how it presented. Back then, no one thought about the. They didn't know. We just didn't know. We didn't have the knowledge that we have now. We didn't know, and also um, because it was so often blamed on poor parenting, parents yep. definitely felt a stigma. Like, oh, I can't take them in to get tested because that's going to reflect on me. And then you're oh not going to get support from the community because you're going to be judged. And especially back then, we didn't have social media. We didn't have these internet communities where you could find support from someone in Missouri or California or across the world, right? Like yeah. you had yeah. your local community, the other exactly. parents in the local school, your church community. That was it. Yeah. Um, and that was depending it. on your faith background and the church you attended, that community may be pro therapy and oftentimes not, not back then. No. So there was a lot of stigma for the parents too. And then of course, what the doctors were looking for, you know, like, oh, it's just boys, it's not girls. Because like I mentioned with, there's can be a lot of grief that comes with it. Like, oh, my life could be so much better. I asked my mom, I was like, how come you never took us? And she was just like, it didn't occur to us. And like, they wouldn't have seen you anyway, because you were great at tests. You weren't the one like in class, like goofing off, whatever. And also it can also manifest itself as like impulsively saying something, not, not like Tourette's, but like, you're just like, Oh, I have an idea and I'm going to spit it out. Right. Right? Right. Um, which, you know, when I was growing up, that was called backtalk and that was a behavioral issue <laughs> like that really, like they would not have connected that with an ADHD symptom at all. Right. And it was just like, Oh, you rude little girl. Like you need to get your behavior together. And like, right. you do like, not have to talk a podcast for that. So, you know, <laughs> right. <laughs> right. <laughs> so, um, you know, talking back or whatever, like that's how it was seen. I mean, and sometimes let's be real. Sometimes that was the case for me. Because I was a little sure. brat, but sure. still a lot of times it wasn't. And then when that's also your social conditioning, um, 
you start pulling back and you're afraid to share your opinions. And so you kind of take on this insecurity that maybe you didn't have before. And, but because of those, you know, like, oh, just try harder. It's saying that to someone with ADHD is telling someone who has difficulty seeing like, oh, just try and see better. Like, no, you're going to get them glasses. You know, if they have type one diabetes, it's like, oh, we'll just try and regulate your mind over matter, regulate your sugar better. Like, no, you're going to get them insulin, right? Right. Like, it's the same telling someone with ADHD, like, just try and focus harder, just eat the frog, just sit down and do it. Yep. Our brains, like, are literally preventing us from getting certain things done. And so, of course, that leads to, you know, guilt trips and like, oh, why am I so dumb? Like, I and why am I so lazy? I'm not lazy. I know I'm not lazy. I know I'm not dumb. But like, why? Why can't I do this? I must not care enough. And so then you're doubting yourself. And then that triggers a shame spiral. And then, you know, it can cause and sometimes it manifests as an inability to compartmentalize, which for me is has always been very difficult as well. And so if something catastrophic was happening in another area of my life, I could not like I would bring that to work because I didn't know how to turn that off. Like my brain wouldn't turn that off while I was supposed to be focusing on work. That said, during a crisis, I'm great in a crisis. I can shut everything off. I'm your girl. Let's get it done. And then afterwards when everyone's like, oh, we got through that. Thank you so much. That's when I kind of fall apart when everyone's like not thinking about it anymore. So um, a crisis, I'm your girl. But, you know, like just the inability to like, leave work at work or home and home and whatever. And so then again, trigger another shame spiral, which can then trigger depression or make it worse. Or, you know, like there's all these things that go into it. And so I think getting the diagnosis in my thirties and why I decided to go seek it out was I think hearing things like this, reading more about it, reading more evidence-based research about it, And just being like, maybe, and if anything, let's go rule it out. Yeah. Right. Like, let's just rule it out. Because if it isn't, then we can focus on something else. But I feel like by my late 30s, I had tried everything and nothing seemed to be working. And I was like, well, it's probably not, but let's just rule it out. Yeah. If you're comfortable with it, uh, could you give us like just a kind of overview of what the actual diagnosis or what the testing was like? Because I think there are probably some people listening who maybe want to get tested, but they're a little afraid of the process. Is that okay for you? Yeah, I think this varies. Um, A psychiatrist is really the only one who can make a diagnosis, not a psychologist, a psychiatrist, one who's also licensed to do medication. You know, and if you have a therapist, they can make a recommendation. Like they're not really ethically, I think they can lose their license maybe if they say something like, oh, you have this, but they can say, I think it might be a good idea for you to also have a conversation with this psychiatrist and like give you a reference. (laughs) For me, it was a series of interview style questions and going back over some things and like, all of that. It wasn't like a sit down diagnostic test. Okay. Good to know. Um, And I don't know how respected those tests are by Mm. the medical community these days. I think there may have been research that showed like they're not that effective, but I don't, again, I'm not a doctor. I'm not like reading this stuff every day. (laughs) I just just know enough for my own life. Yeah, I just wanted to know your um, your lived experience on it, because I know, as back to the TikTok of it all, there are, um, you know, these apps now that are like, click here, take a test. And I'm like, oh, wildly. yeah, those are nonsense. Those, yeah, those are, are nonsense. those are ridiculous. So talk to a, a, a licensed psych, uh, psychiatrist, but yeah, it's just a series of interviews in Lynn's experience. It might be slightly different for you, but it's not at all scary. It doesn't sound like. No, and I think, too. Part of it was I may have been more scared as a younger adult, but again, I was a grown ass woman. <laughs> right. <laughs> my, my own life, my own money, my own, like, I don't have to live like this and let's just rule it out. So it was just kind of at that point, there was also this desperation of 
whatever it is, fix it. If it's not that, tell me right. what else it could be so we can just right, right, right. fix it. Because I was tired of it impacting my work. I was tired of it, especially as an entrepreneur, when you you run the show, you own the show. <laughs> it is your show. Um, you really need your brain to like be showing up for you the way it should. Yeah. Yeah. Ain't nobody's going to do the work if you don't do it. So let's figure mm -hmm. it out. <laughs> mm -hmm. This okay, is my so dream job. So of course I want it to work. I'm not going back to a cubicle. Are you kidding me? No, we're going to figure this brain out. I love that you said that because my husband and I just had this conversation about him sort of saying like, is there a future in which you would go back to working in an office or working at a hotel or working for someone else? And I was like, absolutely not. I will always just figure this out. <laughs> like, I have no desire. 100%. To work yeah. So glad that you said that. Okay. So now we're at the period where you have your diagnosis and now you're... Mm -hmm feeling relief? You're feeling better? How did it, how long did it take for you to sort of sense that like, okay, this, this is working? Um, with the medication. So I got the diagnosis and I went on the medication. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm a big believer. My mom's a pharmacist. So I'm a big believer oh, cool. in better living through chemistry. 1000%. You that. know, again, if the chemicals, if your brain's not making the right chemicals, I don't think there's anything wrong with store-bought to supplement it. Um, sure. But also there's another saying, pills are not skills. So uh -huh. for me, it's uh -huh. always been uh, both and not either or. With the ADHD medication and they put me on Adderall, that's not for everyone. Again, talk to your doctor, talk to your psychiatrist, all of that. Um, I noticed it starting to work right away. Oh, great. And that's not always the case. I also noticed because again, it can coexist or present as depression and anxiety. I had been on medications for those and I never really felt like they worked. So I just went on the ones that didn't make me feel crazy, right? Like the ones who that seemed to like help a little bit, but I was like, what is the fuss? Like none of them seemed to work. Mm -hmm. um, once I went on the Adderall, it seemed to make those medications work better. Interesting. And I think so much so that I did go off the Prozac for a while because I was like, oh, maybe it was just an ADHD thing. Now, mm -hmm. listen, I tapered off like you were supposed to. But did my doctor tell me to go off? No, they didn't. That was a decision I made. And it was a mistake. Don't do that. Um, <laughs> don't make your own decisions about this. Definitely consult with a doctor. Yeah. Um, and it definitely was. I was like, oh, no, I still need that. But the combinations of these medicine made it work because I was treating this. So then this was able to be treated better. You know, it was yeah. both and. So for me, I, I just, everything is so much better. And I remember like maybe like a week into it, I was like, oh, is this how normal people feel every day? I feel amazing. And I think with medication, there's so much stigma around it because it is abused. Like right now there is a shortage. Mm -hmm. And the thing is, again, because it is, if your brain doesn't need it, it is not going to impact your brain the same way as someone who needs it. Right. And so if you have ADHD and you take a stimulant like Adderall, what it's going to do is like calm you down so that you can focus on the one thing you're supposed to be focusing on. Yeah. Whereas if you don't need it, it is going to hyper you up and have an effect that is similar to cocaine. So I've been told oh, I've wow. never done. Um, yeah. I have an addictive personality and, you know, I've been sober 12 years. ADHD isn't the reason for that, but um, it can definitely exacerbate it. And for me, it was alcohol. And so I've just never, but knowing that about myself, I've never, um, with that, even without the ADHD piece, just knowing that addiction runs in my family, like I've yeah, never man. touched, I've never touched hard drugs because of that. But you know, alcohol, that was, you know, I stopped stopping because again, the ADHD yeah. makes it so you have difficulty regulating, like instead right. of a glass or two of wine, I drink the whole bottle and right. this wasn't two buck chuck. I have nice taste. I think I have good taste. So of course you do. this cost me a pretty penny, <laughs> you know, like I was drinking the good stuff. So yeah. Um, but with the medication, 
I found that all of the cognitive behavioral therapy skills I had learned were suddenly working because I could stop and like focus and have the executive functioning enough to do them. Right. Like I could do those things in combination with the medication and things got better. I think if I were only doing the medication, I don't think things would have gotten better that much because again, pills are not skills. Like you still have to, um, have the systems in place. You still have to sit down and do the work. You still have to empty the dishwasher. You still have to, you know, all those things, you still have to do those life skills and you still have to manage your money. Your money doesn't just magically get better. Yeah. You still have to do all that stuff. But I think for me, having that diagnosis and combining the medication with the, the skills and those life hacks made a world of difference. I love that. So I want to talk about the life hacks because you said you have some that you did before diagnosis and then some you've done after. Um, So I want to know what those are. Yeah. So um, again, because I didn't know why I couldn't do certain things. I was just like, oh, well, this is just the way my brain works, but I didn't know why it was that way. Mm. Um, So one of the things that I like a a clean house. I like a nice house. It's calming. I like my things to look nice. Um, That's always been the case, but it used to be like a disaster. Like up until, I don't know, I was 21, like my room would be a disaster. (laughs) My parents would get on me all the time for it. Um, But again, negative reinforcement didn't work. So they're like, you're grounded. And I was like, okay, here's the thing. I can look around this room and know where every single thing is. (laughs) So, but also gross. I don't want to live like that. So, um, I have basket systems and I didn't invent any of this, but I did put it in place for me. I have basket systems, but again, I like aesthetics. I like design. I don't think anyone in the wedding industry is in it because we like ugly things. So I want things to look nice. So, um, you know, it was like a container store or finding the knockoffs at Ross or Marshall's or wherever. Mm-hmm. But, mm-hmm. you know, like um, pretty baskets for this, pretty baskets for that, like all over the house. My sister makes fun of me for so much. But then I go to her house and I redid her whole house. I'm just like, oh, this is nice. I'm like, yeah, because you can find things. Yeah. Um, because that's another thing. They call it the ADHD tax. And that's yeah. just all the different ways it can like cost your life, whether that's financial or not. And some of it is financial in the sense they're like, I don't know where I put that because I didn't have a spot for it. And so now I have four of these things because I keep buying it because I'm like, well, I don't know where it is and I need it right now. I mean, if you you looked around my house, you're going to see about 14 charging cords for the same phone. Oh, yeah. Yeah. My husband (laughs) has ADHD and we have to have everything everywhere because if we can't see it, he'll just go get another one. Right. But that is also another one of my life hacks is make things easy. Yeah. Stop making any decision based on what you should do. Mm. And so I do have chargers in every room. Yep. I do have a charger for traveling that just stays in my suitcase and a charger that stays at my house. Because the mental load of, am I going to unplug this? And then again, you feel lazy because you're like, oh my God, I can't bring myself to unplug this. This is so dumb. But that's just how it is. Um, And like one example of this was with laundry. So my laundry system is every morning I throw a load of clothes or linens or whatever I'm washing that day, one load into the washing machine at lunch, because I work from home at lunch, I change it over. You know, I'm not breaking into my work day to do it right at lunch. I change it over. Now uh, the folding gets delegated to someone else because I've not figured out how to make myself do that yet. Even with medicine. <laughs> um, however, like every day that allows me to stay on top of it every day it's getting done and it's getting done before peak hours, which I know you're in California. I'm on the West coast too. And electricity peak hours are a real thing for us. <laughs> Um, but you know, cleaning the lint trap of the dryer, I did that religiously. However, the garbage can in my little laundry closet situation, there was no garbage can, but it was in the next room over, which was literally like 10 steps away. Uh 
but I would not take the 10 steps to do it. Yeah. And like the a- thought of that was ridiculous. My so, husband just put it on top of the dryer, like a gift for me for later. Yeah. I would just put it on top of the dryer, which is again, gross. And I don't want to live like that. Like it's yuck. Yeah, I agree. So I um, found a cute little container. I think it like a home goods. This is not expensive. And I put it on top of the dryer and it was specifically to put lint in because I couldn't walk the 10 steps to do it. Yep. And, um, and that's another thing you're like, well, I should just get over it and walk the 10 steps. This is stupid. This is a waste of money, even though it was inexpensive, blah, blah, blah. But like, no, we're, we're forgetting nope. the shoulds. This is how, and it makes your life better because it's right there. And then, you know, like once a week you dump it in the larger garbage and it goes out like, that's it. It is not, we don't have to make this complicated. No. You just, you know, spend the $10 or however much it is, get the container, put it on your dryer. It goes in there. It's pretty. So it matches. This is not, you know, again, cause I like the aesthetic of things, yeah. you know, making sure it matches, but getting over the shoulds you see on social media all the time, people will say like, who's buying pre-cut fruit at a grocery store? Who's buying all these pre-cut vegetables? Uh, that would be me. That would be because me. again, yeah. <laughs> with ADHD, part of it too is like, you just don't have the energy, um, especially if you spent all day focusing your energy on like getting that thing done. Yeah. You're just brain fried and tired and you just do not have the mental capacity or the energy to make dinner. And now I know people are listening and they're like, isn't that everyone? Yes. But again, right. Like pregnancy brain, it impacts you for a little bit, but for people with ADHD, it's times a million all day, every day. So part of it is just having healthy foods that I can grab and eat when I'm not going to make dinner, yeah. when I'm just not for myself. Um, I will say having other people rely on you for dinner changes that a little bit, but then, then you also have other people you can delegate to. But if it's just exactly. for me, you know, because I'm not. I mean, I could order DoorDash every day and I've gone through periods of time where I have, and that is just also not a great way to live for your nutrition wise or bank account. Like it's just not good. So yeah, Um, like just those little life hacks, I habit stacking and I know you're very big into habits, but like I like a clean kitchen when I go to bed so that I wake up to a clean kitchen. That's the, that's the big thing. I need to walk into a clean kitchen in the morning Yes. Otherwise, it throws my whole day into chaos because I started with chaos. Yep. So, you know, I unload the dishwasher um, every morning while the coffee's brewing. I put the coffee on. I unload the dishwasher. It takes three to five minutes max. Yep. But if it's not in conjunction with the coffee in my brain and like, oh, it's going to take so long. No, it doesn't. It's done by the time like your little carafe is filled with coffee. It's done. Yep. And then it's throughout done. the day. Everyone rinses things off, puts it in the dishwasher. And then after dinner, I start it, wipe down the kitchen. That's it. So that gets done every day along with the laundry every day. Like those are kind of my life hacks. And I started that before knowing because I just needed to have it work. And then with my business, one of the things I realized early on, because I was as a business consultant, I was on a retainer model. Um, You know, so people pay a fee every month based on a certain amount of hours. And then you work down the hours from there. It's like a lawyer model. And what I was realizing was, especially in the wedding and events industry, hospitality industry, where there are so months, everyone is so busy. And then there are other just dead months where you're not doing anything. And so you have time to work on your business. And so my clients, there were months where like, you're just not going to get a hold of them. And they are not even remotely thinking about their business because it is full steam ahead, all hands on deck. Let's get these events happening, especially in places where it's very seasonal, um, you know, where everything, every event is condensed into the four months of summer. So then I would feel guilty because I'm like, well, I know he's, you know, like, I like just, what am I doing for you this month? This I'm not a publicist. So it's not like I can be doing the work behind the scenes pitching. Right. Like this is strategy. Right. Like I, I need you to be here and we need to be working on this together. Yeah. So um, I switched to project-based. I call it in dates, not endless retainers. 
Now, some of those projects are still a retainer, but they are on a fixed project length. It is not like, oh, forever. And then, you know, in five years, if you decide you don't need us anymore, we'll move on. Because one, I like to sleep at night and I felt guilty, you know, like just for that month. But then also you can't really roll over the unused hours because the entire point of retainer model is they have you on retainer, which means you can't book other clients for those allotted hours because what if your original client needs you, right? Like that's the entire concept behind it. Right. And so um, just for me, restructuring my system, my business processes to do project model, it also worked better for my brain. Mm -hmm. And because I find strategy and solving very complex problems to be creative. And that's what makes me feel the most creatively fulfilled. And I love that. And I love that every client has a different problem. And I specialize in the challenges of success. You know, every level of success brings its own set of problems. You never truly make it. There's always going to be something new once you reach a higher tier, something new to deal with. Mm -hmm. Um, And I love solving those different challenges as people get further into their careers and like things they never dreamt about in years five, 10, 15, but now they're 30 years in and they're like, Oh my gosh, I'm dealing with this. And then for 29 years, I never even knew this was an issue I could have in my business. And I love figuring that stuff out. Um, But that is also very conducive to a project based thing because once we figure it out, we're moving on. We don't need to be talking about this forever. And if we are, I'm not good at my job. So you you would have made that switch if you um, hadn't gotten the diagnosis. I know you said you were like moving there before, but like, does that in your mind intrinsically tie in? I made that switch years before the diagnosis. I made that switch like two or three years into my business. Ah, got it. And a lot of that was due to just my own. I felt like I was wasting people's money for the months that they were so busy. They couldn't even, you know, stop. No, it makes sense. It totally makes sense. Yeah. So I switched it then because I was just like, oh, this is more creatively fulfilling for me. And then with the ADHD diagnosis, I was like, oh, that's why I did that. Like, oh, that's (laughs) why. That makes so much sense. Here's some ways I can, you know, maybe fine tune it and make it even better. Yeah. Now that I understand what I'm working with, you know. Yeah. Do you have the the ADHD symptoms of like time blindness and or losing things? Time blindness, yes, for sure. Um, the which again, guilt aim spiral. I, I would right. go to Target and be like, I'm just gonna wander around, but I'll be out in an hour. You know, like I went in for two things, and you walk out with a hundred. Like that's everyone's Target story. And they love it. That's how they make money. But I would uh, go in and all of a sudden I'd look up and it was like four hours later and I have like five things in my cart. And I'm like, what the fuck did I do in Target for four hours? I wasn't trying on clothes. I wasn't like, like, what did I look at for four hours in Target Yes. when they didn't have that much new inventory? Like, what is happening? Like, yeah, I would just look up and it'd be gone. Um, My husband does this too, which is why I asked. He literally just hours go by. He'll say like, I'm going to Home Depot. And I'm like, I will see you tomorrow because I know you're not coming home. Like, what is happening? Uh, He also does the thing, which I think is related to time blindness, when it's like, if we have an appointment at noon, he doesn't do anything in the morning because the noon appointment is happening. And then afterwards he's like, well, that was the whole day. And I was like, it was an hour at noon. Oh yeah, that's a big ADHD thing of, I, you know, like, oh, well, I have this thing at noon. I have this thing at two. So there's my day. Yeah. Like even this morning, I knew I had, so I have a lot of international clients and I knew I had a call at 6 a.m. my time because it's, you know, almost evening their time. And that is part of, you know, if you want to do international clients, if you want to do destination work with overseas clients, like that's part of like the decision you have to make when you take that on. Like, is this really the right fit for me? And so I'm happy to do it. I'm happy to flex for their time zone, but I knew that. And so then I knew I had this thing with you at 11. And then um, that person emailed and said, caught up in another client meeting. Can we push it, you know, to nine your time? And I was like, oh, nine's so close to 11. And then I was like, this is a 15 minute call. 
Yeah. Yes, I have time. And of course I did it. But like my initial reaction with that ADHD was like, oh, I don't think I can because I need to be like locked in for that 11 thing a.m. podcast recording with Renee. I was like, I I think I can take 15 minutes at 9 a.m. to talk to this person. (laughs) We've been trying to get this on the schedule forever. Well, and that's a great example of like the pills are not skills. Like it was the, you, you're on your Medicaid, but you also had to like, you know, have the skill to be like, actually, let me rethink that. I actually do have, right. time, you know, like stopping and questioning your thoughts, yeah. which is a huge thing with, yes. I mean, that's not an ADHD thing, but that is a, that's a good thing, thing. therapy yeah. meditation skill that helps of like, yes. oh, don't believe everything you think, question everything. <laughs> Um, you know, and you know, when you have a negative thought, just like step back and be like, huh, and talk to your brain. Like, why do you say that? What makes you yeah. say that? Who said okay. That? Do you have evidence for that? Yeah. Oh, really? I think you're just being a bully, you know, like, or, mm, right. okay, that makes sense. I, I think that is something to, you know, be aware of and like avoid that risk. But yeah. like, if you just step back and evaluate your thoughts that way, and that takes therapy to learn that mm-hmm. takes um, meditation changed my life. And I think a lot of people think of meditation as clearing your head and it's not, it's, it's a time where you allow um, thoughts to come into your head to come and go. And you just sit there and you don't judge them and you don't attach any value to them. And it's an exercise. So like physical exercise that works on physical muscles, you have to be consistent with it for it to work. And so people will be like, Oh, I tried meditation. It didn't work. You know, like, my mind was still racing. And I was like, well, yeah, it's the clear head thing I've never experienced ever. No. But meditation completely changed my life in that That's sense. Like meditation practice, like a yoga practice. You're not going to, it's exactly. not going to work be good if you do it once. I, meditation has changed my brain and changed my life since the pandemic. And I won't stop yelling about it. That in combination with journaling, and I've been journaling since I was a kid, but like those mm-hmm. two accessible, very easy, quote unquote, easy as in doesn't take up too much time, easy. Uh, mm-hmm. Things have really changed who I am as a, as a person. And so I will never stop yelling about those on the podcast. I will never stop teaching about it because it's, it's sort of the thing in our industry, because we all know the wedding industry, events industry is uh, top five most stressful, but yet we never talk about the what to do about it. We're like, isn't it suck? We have really stressful jobs. Anyway, I worked 72 hours last week and you're like, Wait, what? So that's my tangent for the day. But I wanted to ask you before I lose this train of thought on myself, um, physically losing items, does your ADHD manifest in that way? It did. And then I like put in my systems of, yeah. and again, did not invent this, <clears throat> a place for everything and everything in its place with like the cute baskets, the cute containers. Yes, yes, yes. I have that. Um, but also, you know, those TikTok restocking videos and like everything's in cute clear containers in the fridge. And Mm -hmm. people are always like, why would you do that? It already comes in a box. That's me. I do that. And part of it is I like Mm -hmm. how it looks. Again, I like design. I like aesthetics. I like things to look cute. But also if I can see it, I'll eat it. If I can see, if I can see the cereal, I'll eat it. And also, again, when you have other people in your house, I mean, yes. how many of us have opened a pantry and like pulled out a box of something and it was empty because kids what? or a spouse or whomever <laughs> left it empty and couldn't take it to the recycle. Mm-hmm. So, mm-hmm. you know, did- if I can see it, I can eat it. If I see yeah. it, I will use it. But then there are also things that are out of sight, out of mind. And so I'm fine with those things being um, put away. Yeah. I will. We, we made a switch to the clear boxes a la the home edit a couple of years ago. I had my assistant Kelsey come in and basically like do it. Cause I was like, if I try to do it, I'll get halfway through and then give up because that's me. Um, but that is an ADHD husband, thing though. Just FYI. <laughs> I, I know, know we're not diagnosing it, but I'm just raising the awareness of this other like, symptom. You know, it. Yeah. Listen, listen, let me finish writing my book and then I'll go get diagnosed. You guys, come on. The book's not about ADHD. Don't worry. Um, anyway, everything got into the clear boxes and it's been so much easier. Are we out of eggs? Joe's like, immediately we have two eggs left. Are we out of dishwasher pots? Yeah. I don't know. Look in the clear box. Like we, we have exactly. really reduced the amount of mental load we have just in running this house, even though it's just the two of us and the cat. The other thing we did for my husband, and I just wanted to mention this in this episode, because I actually, when I gifted this to him, thought like, this is such a shitty gift. My husband constantly for year, years, Lynn, years would lose his wallet and his keys every day. 
every day he would lose them and he would he would get so upset with himself for losing them that there would be like a big emotional thing right and it was like a blow up and it would happen literally every day so i when air tags came out i bought him air tags for everything mm -hmm. he has an air tag on his keys on his phone on his wallet uh it's in our luggage of course obviously everyone does that but the, these little everyday things and i thought he was going to be like insulted about this <laughs> gift and he was like well let's see how it goes he has not had that sort of emotional reaction to losing something in like two years now and it was solved by a, a tiny investment in an air tag uh i can't believe how easy it is now he never loses anything or or he still yeah, misplaces yeah. them but he can find them in five seconds it's great i have one on my dog's collar because she likes to dash out of the house and run away <laughs> So, um, you know, without the leash. She's living free. She needs to go visit the neighborhood. She's She has to visit and people. She will, but she's also little, so cars can't see her. So I have one on her. Oh. Um, yeah, those are great. I also have, and again, this predates my diagnosis, but I have this really cute crystal dish that I inherited from my grandmother, and it's on the entry console table, and I just drop the keys in there every single time. And it's that yeah. habit. But if for some reason, you know, I'm unloading the car with groceries and the keys didn't make it in there and then forget, it. I don't know where they are. Are they in my pocket or they did they get in my purse? Like, did I leave them in the kitchen? Like, I don't know. So, yeah, yeah I try in those habits, but air tags have been a game changer for sure. But the thing you mentioned about him, like blowing up and like just getting upset when he couldn't find it and it was an everyday occurrence emotional dysregulation and the inability to regulate emotions is a huge ADHD symptom. And that oh, manifests yeah. differently. And I think um, for men, and again, whether this is social conditioning or literally just a male biological thing, we don't know, but it does express itself as like outward angry yeah. outbursts or like yeah. self like flagellation almost like, oh, I'm so stupid. I can't believe I did that again, but like verbalizing that out loud. 100%. And for me, I don't cry all the time, but I can't control when I start and I can't turn it off. Yeah. I just cannot control if I'm crying, uh, it's going to be done when it's done. Yeah. Like, and again, eighties, nineties kid. And so I entered the workforce maybe a little bit younger than my exact age peers because I, I took an internship right out of college and like delayed college and started there at this nonprofit full time. I was an executive. There's, there's a whole long story that goes with that. But my mentors were the boomers of like, oh, you can't get ahead of a, as a woman. There's no crying at work. There's no crying in baseball. Like, you can't get ahead as a woman if you're like crying. So it was yeah. very much like, no, but you know, um, and even in the mid 2000s, you know, famous, Kelly Catrone was like, go outside and cry. We're not doing that in here, you know, her show. And yes. so I was just like, but I can't. Oh. <laughs> so something triggers it. It's just, there it is. And that's yes. still the case. Um, now it's, the triggers don't come as often, but yeah. it, like, I can't turn it off. Like that is not, and I know a lot of women can, and I know a lot of white women can, and they do weaponize it, but mm -hmm. Um, I can't like that is like, it yeah. is, that is how my emotional dysregulation manifests is through that. And it's very frustrating. Yeah. I've tried to reframe the no crying thing. Cause I definitely grew up with that. Uh, and my family had this horrible, my grandmother used to call it crocodile tears. It doesn't mean anything really. It just meant like, mm -hmm. you, even though I was never faking as a kid, I was very, I was very emotionally in tune to everything, but it got beaten out of me. Not literally, but like emotionally because they were like no one want, like stop with the fake crying now as a, a 48 year old woman uh i always if i'm crying i think like oh my body needs to release something here like this is it's cathartic and like i try not to stop it when i can when i can let it happen and i'm not like on stage or whatever <laughs> you know um yeah but i've had to for myself yeah. yeah i try when i'm putting together speaking presentations um I really try and avoid, and this is one of the reasons I practice them out loud beforehand, like in the mirror, like a dress rehearsal, is because yes. if there's something in there that like triggers something unexpected, um, 
I'll try and take it out and replace it with maybe a different example because there was a speaking engagement I did. And this has to be like, I don't know, 18, 19 years ago now. And I was telling this story. It wasn't a personal story, but it was just an example that I was using in the presentation. And I had never, thinking about it never made me choke up. But when I was saying it out loud, I choked up and mm -hmm. then I couldn't stop. And thankfully it was, you know, I mean, it was in a training for like a group of hotel GMs from around the country. So I'm like, that's really, I have to knock this off. But yeah. I like couldn't stop. And thankfully they were um, compassionate and nice, but you can't have that every time. So now I try and like preemptively take care of yeah. that, but Makes it's sense. still, you know, if something triggers me to cry and I'm on stage, it's not going to stop. I can't, no. again, the compartmentalization, not there. I cannot no. turn it off. Well, and like, the only way um, out of that is through it. Hard. I think so you have to just keep going through the emotion, through the feeling, just keep going. Yeah. 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 It's tough. I will say though, one of the things talking about like the emotional regulation and the shame spirals and like beating yourself up, whether that's vocally or just internally, one of the things I started doing, and again, I don't think I invented this, but I didn't read about it anywhere, but I think it's a pretty common thing is I call it the affirmation alphabet. And when I go to sleep, when like I can't turn my brain off and you're thinking of all the dumb things you said that day or all the things that could have gone differently, or again, that thing in third grade, yeah. whatever, I will just go through the alphabet and be like, okay, I am ambitious. I am brave. I am creative. I am you know, driven, yeah. well, you just go through because when you give your brain something to focus on like that, that's where the focus is going to go. I've never made it to Z. I'm always out. So it <laughs> helps. It's my sleep hack. But that. what I found is because neuroplasticity is a thing. And again, we didn't even have the technology to really discover this until the eighties no. because you can literally change your neural pathways. Because I am doing that every night, just as my sleep hack to fall asleep. Yeah. When those other, you know, when, when I would normally experience a shame spiral or experience the like, ugh, you know, self, you know, just beating myself up, almost all of that went away. Oh, and it's because true. night after night, it was just a byproduct of night. Again, it's a form of meditation. Night after night, I was like doing those affirmations and your brain's taking that in and your brain takes that in as truth. And so yeah. it did kind of rewire how I respond to myself just because I, you know, did this sleep hack. So if people are struggling with that, I do recommend that method. And if you're not used to speaking to yourself kindly, you're going to feel so cheesy, so corny, but people can call it corny or cringe, but I call it living my best life. So yeah, it, works. Um, it works. I have a question for you that was not on our initial question. So if you don't want to answer this, we can always cut this part out. But um, I know you're also an educator and a speaker. Um, since your diagnosis, have you changed anything about the way you present or the way you teach just based on what you know now about your own brain? That's a great question. I don't know that I have. Hmm. Not if I have, it hasn't been intentional because of that short term memory situation. I usually will have, you know, branded note cards, like they'll use on talk shows, little half size note cards with your logo on them. Yeah. I'll have a branded note card. I have a bunch of them for speaking engagements and I don't ripped out my um, talks. I never have, but I'll have the bullet points on there. Wow. And sometimes I look at it and sometimes I don't, but even though I present without them, most of the time it's there tucked away on the podium that I'm standing far away from not using. Right. So if my brain goes blank, I can just kind of walk back over, take a glance and my brain will pick up where it needs to. Yeah. Part of my ability to do that, I think comes from studying music growing up. You know, mm -hmm. you have to like learn all that stuff and then be able to like, recall it and put it back out there. And it's not straight memorization, especially as you get more advanced, you like know, and you're memory. able to riff on it, right? Yeah. Like you're able to take in all the information and then like it's jazz, right? And a yeah. lot of public speaking, I think good public speakers are treated a little bit like jazz. You have all this information input 
and then you're putting it out there and it's not 100% scripted, but you have the bullet points and general outline that you're following. Yeah, um, that's how I do. Yeah. yeah. So I will have usually a note card with me um, just for that peace of mind for me, because I find yeah. that if I have it, then my brain can like relax, not think about it, and then just do what it does. And yeah. The speaking yeah. comes and it's great. And I didn't look at it once, but it was there. And I feel like if it wasn't there, maybe I would freeze because I was so stressed about that. Right. right. And on just the act of making the note cards, I think is helpful too. I, I ask because uh, one, I have a really close friend who is a, has been diagnosed with ADHD. And I was listening to her speak a couple of years ago at the special event. And she mentioned it in her opening. She said, and just so you know, um, I have ADHD. So, and I don't remember the, it was the context was just sort of like, like just something to know about me. Right. Um, mm -hmm. But then I'm also working with um, a couple of speakers who are new to wedding to BA this year, who like came to me for coaching. And uh, one of them is uh, neurodiverse. And so we're in the writing portion of, of this talk. We're trying to, we're sort of having to just keep an eye that things are progressing in a way that would make sense for most people. You know, right. that the content is connected in some way, because um, right. the way the, the way they wrote it was a little bit like a spider web as opposed to like a straight line. So we're trying to do that. And it's just been interesting with this new knowledge of um, of you just how everyone's brain is different and how people learn differently. Um, it just gives something to be aware of, I think. You know, I, this is just off the top of my head, thinking about what you just said. I don't know. So my every. Every project I do, every blog post, every speaking engagement, it all starts with a brain dump in the notes app on my MacBook. Like it is just everything just out there, just full brain dump that gets saved. And then I go through, period it, whittle it down, make the connections, you know, put it together. But one of the things, and I've actually credited a lot of my success in my career with this is that. For like three solid years in high school, I was in AP English literature classes where you are basically prepping for the AP test where you have to recall a book you read five years ago and make, you know, thoughtful, persuasive arguments for or against it or whatever the assignment is. And every Friday for those three years, we'd walk into the classroom. The topic was written on the board. And you had until the end of the bell to get it done, the entire project. So I learned how to write fast. I learned how to write well. I learned how to write clearly, concisely, as well as um, get the point across in a way that made sense. And all the writing classes I took in college can't touch those three years of high school. Like that really, I think, shaped it. And so for me with the speaking, even though it all starts as that disjointed, disconnected brain dump. I think it is those editing skills that I learned from those years that probably has always impacted how I write a final presentation. You know, I never thought about AP English until you mentioned this, but I also was in AP English. And so, uh, yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, like, it's, it's a you know, skill being able to write in a 50 minute amount of time because I'll have yeah. people and they're like, how do you, I mean, lately I haven't been blogging that often, but for a long time, that was my main marketing, my main, yeah. how I did everything. And people would say like, how do you just produce that much content? Aren't you working? I'm like, of course I'm working, but it doesn't take that long. And they'd be like, I spent an entire afternoon, an entire day writing one post to 400 words. And I'm like, that would take me 15 minutes. Yeah. Like it's just a 400 words is a few paragraphs. It's 15 minutes. Like, yeah. but it really comes back to those were skills that were honed when I didn't even realize like those skills took me so far in my career. Yeah. I, I'm and now my mind is a little bit blown. Cause I'm like, yeah, I never thought about high school, but yeah, that really makes a lot of sense. It's so interesting. I, and I say this, I've said this a lot on the show and it just continues to be true. The older I get every single thing that we do in our lives before we become entrepreneurs, it all just it condenses and we go, Oh yeah. All of your life skills. There you go. You're going to need all of them. Right. So sorry to tell you, but even the stuff that happened in kindergarten, you're going to need all of it. Here you go. 
Go, go be an entrepreneur. bring it all to the table. You bring it all to the table, which is also why I'm a huge advocate of therapy. Because even if you are good at compartmentalizing, you're still bringing your full self to the table at work. And uh, you need to get some of your stuff together. 100%. Okay, last thing I want to ask you is... Um, something that you had in your notes, which I made me giggle when I saw it, is um, how do we not make an AD, ADHD diagnosis our whole personality? Go. <laughs> you just don't. I mean, that's, <laughs> I mean, that is, I know that's as useful as like, just focus and get over it and just do it. But um, I'm big on this in any way. And I think a lot of the ADHD resources, like the blogs and podcasts and everything that's out there right now, I still don't relate to a lot of it because mm-hmm. I feel like, They've made it their entire identity. We all have quirks. We're all quirky in some way, but like my personality is not quirky. I'm so quirky. That's just not my personality. I like nice things. I like things to look nice. I'm not okay with like being a slob and being like, oh, it's just ADHD. And also I feel very strongly. And I just, I recently um, was talking to someone else about this, about, you know, going through cancer the last couple of years and coming out of it. And I it's not my entire identity. It is something that happened to me. I don't say I'm a migraine survivor. And I know those are two hugely different things and I'm not trying to complete them, but I'm just saying like, it's something that happened in my life and we dealt with it. And if it comes back, we'll deal with it again. And the ADHD, like this is something I have. It is not who I am. And I think, I think this is a big flaw in the personal branding world is that we put ourselves, we narrow ourselves down, we shrink ourselves into these boxes. And then we get mad when everyone perceives us as only those boxes. And so I, we can't control how we're perceived, but we can control how we present ourselves. And I am a complicated, imperfect, multifaceted human. And I'm going to try my best to show up as the highest and best version of myself every single day. That's not always going to happen. And I don't want people to be like, well, you always, you know, branded yourself as this or you blah, 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 or, oh, she has ADHD. So she, we can't hire her for this longer term project. I'm like, oh, you can, because I have all these skills and hacks that I've worked very hard on. So like, don't preclude me from a job because like you have what it is in this box. But then also there is still stigma around it. Like- I've heard people from the main stage at big conferences, main big name speakers in the industry. And they didn't say ADHD specifically, but you know, it's very much like, oh, these new kids, they can't focus. And like, they're tired. And like, what do you have to be tired about? You're 25, like blah, blah, blah. And then, you know, they go on and like encourage people. Like if you have someone like that on your team, they don't care. They can't get it done. You just like release them and move on. And I'm like, first of all, that advice is illegal. So maybe don't say it from a main stage at a giant conference that's being recorded. Second, (laughs) um, it always made me feel that like, it wasn't a safe space. This is the first time I'm really, truly talking about it in like publicly, um, aside from little comments here and there on social media, just because one, it's not my identity. I don't need to talk about it every day. I don't need to remind people that I have it every day, but also because there are people in gatekeeper roles in the sense that they do decide who does and does not get opportunities in this industry. And they have publicly been very judgmental about mental health, ADHD, depression, all of anxiety, all of those things. And whether that's intentional or not, or just internalized stigmas and misinformation, they still, it still impacts how they're making decisions and who they're choosing. And so I don't want to put myself in a box that then gives people license to say, sure. Oh, well, she's known for this, which means X, Y, Z. Right. And you don't want to limit your opportunities or become the poster child for like ADHD wedding entrepreneurs. Like that's not right. Because I'm not like, that's not, I don't have time to be that. Right. Like that's not, I already deal with enough. I don't need to (laughs) take that on too. By the way, let me say here, because I didn't want to interrupt you when you were talking about it. I'm very, very, very glad that you're okay and that you've recovered from your cancer. Oh, thank you. Me too. Not to make it your whole personality, but I just wanted to say that. 
The last thing I want to cover is um, something that you have in your notes here, which is that you are sorry to report that cardio helps. So tell us what you what you do as far as exercise to help with ADHD. Yeah, that's the whole pills aren't skills situation. No. Um, no. You know, it's always like fix your nutrition, do cardio, all of that. And part of the reason, you know, if you go in for a depression, talk to a doctor about depression or whatever or even ADHD, one of the things they're always going to order first is blood work. And it's something like 90% of serotonin is produced in your gut and iron is the mineral that takes it through your bloodstream to your brain. So if you're iron deficient, you're going to be more depressed because it's you don't have the minerals getting what you need to where it needs to go to make it work. Yeah. And so, um, you know, they're always like, cardio is great for ADHD. And I was like, oh, cardio, ugh. Um, even though I have a minor in dance, even though I have, you know, all of that, I was never the athletic kid. Like you were like, oh, I'm bad at math. I was like, oh, I'm bad at sports. Ugh, I'm not athletic. Oh, so even I'm though I have kid. this degree, degree in a physical activity, <laughs> but very much, I did not do cardio for fun. I still don't run. It's not fun for me. I will say, and again, eighties, nineties diet culture and being a teenager in the nineties during that time. Yep. That also plays into it as well. And so I really did see exercise and fitness as a form of punishment or a body type goal versus, oh, this can clear my head. And I find for me now, and I will say that reward system motivation, I think Peloton has really nailed that. Yeah, um, whether that's I'm whether you're up. using the equipment or whether you're using the app, whatever it is, those little blue dots are like my new personal pan pizza. Like I, I can't break the streak. It's it. got to be a streak of blue dots. The challenges, um, the artist series. Tell me when I you know, right. tell me that they you know, really nailed that. And yes. I always found a lot of dopamine release from spin classes, like the entire class at Flywheel or whatever studio I was going to pre-pandemic. I'd be like, this sucks. I can't believe I'm doing this. Why do I do this to myself? And the <laughs> second I'm off the bike at the end of the hour, I'm like, oh, when's the next one? And then like the night before the next class, I like can't go to sleep because I'm so excited because that dopamine rush is still there recalling it. Yep. Um, and so, you know, pandemic, when we all had to switch, that's when, because of those blue dot situation, and then there's a group, if you have the Peloton app or the equipment or whatever, there's a free group on Facebook called Hardcore on the Floor. And I had joined that. And she basically just programs different classes every day that like, you don't have to think about it. You're just like, oh, oh I'll take cool. like this series of classes. And I think it's like 40, 45 minutes every day. It's like a 10 minute wait class and whatever. But like she, she's a personal trainer who like programs it out using their classes. It's a huge group now. And so I was taking classes. I never thought I would take, I was doing weights that I know I was never like lifting weights beside like the three pound bar weights. Mm -hmm. Um, that totally changed for me. And I realized for me around the 30 minute mark of cardio is when like, there's a lift happiness, lift, mental clarity in my head. I was like, oh, this is what people mean when they say they like to work out. Yeah. And I am so sorry. Like cardio mm -hmm. does work as advertised for ADHD. It does mm -hmm. help. Um, you just got to do it, but find cardio that you enjoy. Like I said, I still don't run. Not happening. I don't, I do not like it. No, thank you. No, but there's but so I'll, many other ways you can do but it. I'll do an hour on the Peloton with Robin. She's my teacher. She's my favorite. I'm glad you mentioned the duration of time as well, because I think that that is something we don't often talk about when we're talking about like exercise for mental wellness as well. There is a, there's a duration that you have to find with yourself. Like you said, 30 minutes for you to get the lift. I really need like 45 minutes of cardio for me to feel that if I do 15 minutes, it's like, I'm, I may as well be, you know, doing my nails or something like it doesn't do anything for me i need like a hard right. uh, in more intense at least 45 minutes um, yeah it's yeah. it's funny that you mentioned robin because again motivation style i find her motivation style demotivating and so she's oh, really? just not the instructor for me and i know so yes. many people like you who adore her and they're your go-to whereas like olivia's um mm. classes are yeah. hands down the hardest of any instructors on the entire platform 
and I'll do a 10 minute one. And I usually start my workout with a 10 minute ab class of hers. And because her motivation style resonates with me so much, I have that, like, I kind of need it to start my day in my morning routine, just because it sets my mood for the entire day. Now, as a bonus, I have the best abs I've ever had in my forties in my life. But Love it. even if those physical muscular changes hadn't changed, it really like that's the right tone mentally for my entire day. And a lot of that is a combination of the exercise, but just her motivation style. And so I think that's one thing I like about that um, that company too, is they have a zillion different instructors. You can find who works for you. But one of the weight classes through that hardcore programming it was a Robin class and I was doing it. And like part of it, she was like, no one feels sorry for you. And I was like, Ooh, why oh, not? Really? I, I can't do the nugging. I can't like, that does not motivate me. No, thank you. So, um, but I yeah. can see doing that every so often, but yeah, normally she talks about how we have to keep our crowns straight. I always cry. I, oh, if there's a long ride okay. with Robin, I will cry on the bike and just be like, this is what it is today. Oh. The bike. I can't, I can't handle her. And sh- I'm sure she's a very nice person in real life. I don't know. But like her style is just not for me. Like that's very much that Amy Poehler quote, like good for you, not for me. One hundred percent. But good I also fit think for you, not for me. It's like you, we all have to find the the people that motivate us, and also like for exercise, and also like the duration of what we need because it's not exactly. universal. It's different for it's everybody. Not every brain. Yeah. Yep. I love that. All right. Yeah. Well, I could talk to you for another hour and a half about this, but I know uh, we have to let people get back to their to their lives and perhaps their own ADHD diagnoses. Who knows? Where can people find you on the internet? Thinksplended.com and Thinksplended on all socials. Lynn, thank you so much for being here and so much for this like super honest, super candid, super helpful conversation. Um, maybe after I'm finished writing my book, maybe we'll have another conversation (laughs) about my own journey with ADHD, but um, I hope it was helpful for you to share as well. It was. Thank you. And also I will say it might help you finish the book, getting a diagnosis before and not after, but again, who knows? 10,000 words away from this draft. I just got to, I got to hammer it out. Crank it out. Crank it out. 10,000 words. That's nothing. Yeah. It's nothing. I'm just like, we have to finish it this week, but you know, talk to me, talk to me in a couple of weeks after. Lynn, thanks so much. I can't wait to see you in person again, hopefully soon. And for everyone else, thank you for spending your time with us today and we'll see you next week. Bye.